John chapter 15, where we were last Sunday. Verse uh, 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I've kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. The Savior had just commanded us in verse 9, continue ye in my love. And remember that word continue is a synonym of the word abide. It's the same Greek word, meno. Abide in my love, continue in my love. And the way we do that is by keeping his commandments. He flat out tells us, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. And we pointed out to you that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord, our God. And that being the case, he is to be loved with the totality of our being, just as we are commanded to love God. And the passage we gave you that drives that point home that we want to elaborate on is found in Mark chapter 12, where Jesus was asked by one of the scribes what the first and great commandment was. And he answered in verse 29 of Mark 12, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, for this is the first commandment. So that tells us that we're to love our God, and we're talking here about the Lord Jesus Christ with all that is within us. And Jesus teaches us plainly that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. So if you don't keep his commandments, there's just one conclusion. You don't love him. That's all there is to it. Now, this particular passage I've just read in Mark is a quotation from one that is oft cited by the Jews um, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, where he said in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And they often recite that line in Hebrew. And then, that being the case, this commandment flows out of it. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And Jesus takes those three words and he breaks them down for us in saying that we're to love him with all the heart, with all the soul, which we saw there in Deuteronomy. And he also says with all the mind, which as we're going to see is a function of the heart and the soul, the mind. And then with all thy strength, which is a synonym of the word might. Now, I preached on Deuteronomy 6 a number of years ago, did a series on it. And then uh, when I was doing our Ephesians series, as I came down to the last verse where we talked about grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus in sincerity, I repeated at that time something I had taught back when I taught on Deuteronomy 6. So in the event that maybe you don't remember what I said back then about that, or maybe it would do well to have your mind stirred up by way of remembrance. Oh, there you are. I was looking for you, Justin. You were the mystery man today. Now the mystery is dissolved. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, we are. I'm going to just remind you of what I told you then about loving Christ, who is our God, with all the soul, the heart, the soul, the mind, the strength. There's five things that are entailed in that. Five things. Number one, if we love Christ, and like Jesus said, continue ye in my love. This is what we're supposed to do. We're to love him. We're to keep loving him. Abide in that love. Continue in that love. This should should define the course of our life. We are to love him, number one, supremely. Number two, sincerely. Number three, strongly. Number four, intelligently. And number five, entirely. And let me give you an idea of where I'm going to go with this. Because after I break those five down, then I want to just come into this thing of loving him with all the heart, the mind, the soul. And we want to talk about the heart and its function and uh, how it is we're to love him with all of our heart. And then we'll elaborate on from there. Now, first of all, we're to love him supremely. Which simply means that our love for Jesus Christ should surpass our love for anyone and anything else. Now, it's easy for me to get up here and say that. It's easy for you to sit there and listen to that. It's easy for you to say that. 
but now live it. That's the key here. And we, we are allowed, of course, to love other persons and love other things. Um, Isaac loved savory meat. And we're commanded to love our wives and to love our children and to love our brethren. And so there are other persons and things we may certainly love, but only within this framework of loving Jesus Christ first and foremost. It should always be within the framework of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. If your love for somebody takes you outside the framework of his commandments, then you love them more than you love him. It's, it's as simple, basic as that. You say, well, um, I, just, I just love my mother too much, and I know she just couldn't handle me not celebrating Christmas. Well, then you love your mother more than you love Jesus. That as an example of that. Or I, can't, I can't join that church. My parents just couldn't handle it. Then you love them more than you love Jesus. And that's not loving him supremely. That's not loving him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then secondly, we are to love him sincerely. And we have the commandment to do that in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 24. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. And that means without any hypocrisy and without any pretense. There must be no... Keep that right there. And we'll be all ready to go if that happens again. You know, you know the old joke, where was Moses when the lights went out? <laughs> where we just were <laughs> in the dark. All right, well, thank God the lights are on. So anyway, sincerely... Meaning that there must be no pretense in our love for Jesus Christ. Don't sit there and say you love him when you show you don't by stubbornly refusing to do what he tells you to do. That's hypocrisy. Oh, I just love him so much. And here comes a commandment. Oh, but I can't do that. Then you don't love him. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I mean, it breaks down to everyday stuff. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church, nourish them, cherish them, treat them with tenderness and affection, make much of them. If you refuse to do that, you don't love Jesus like he told you to do. Women are told to reverence their husbands. And if you just rebel, rebel and run him down, run him down rather than reverencing him, you can say you love Jesus, but you really don't because you're not doing what he said. He tells you women to be a keeper at home. Well, I don't like to do housework then you don't like to do what Jesus told you to do. So don't sit there and say you love him when you show by your life you don't. He tells us to forgive our brother. Well, I just can't forgive. Well, then you can't do what Jesus told you to do. You don't love him then, see? There can be no pretense in this. Love him sincerely, truly, which means your life is going to be devoted to endeavoring to do what he told you to do. That's how you show you really, really do love him. The Bible says, let us not love in word, but in deed and in truth. Let what you do show it, and not just what you say. And then we are to love him strongly. And you can see this in, in, in um, the Song of Solomon. as a beautiful passage here about love. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. And the reason I cite the three examples that I do, or the four, five examples that I did, is that's just bringing this thing down to everyday life where we live it, see. And that's where the test really comes. We can all sit here in church and say, oh, how I love Jesus, but what am I doing the next day that shows it? When I'm not under the surveillance of the pastor and the brethren in an atmosphere like this. And then in Song of Solomon 8, 6, and 7, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. And death's a pretty tough thing. Try to get out of it. The Bible says we're powerless in the day of our death. That's how powerful it is. Love is strong as death. Jealousy, which is a byproduct of love, is cruel as the grave. The coals were of our coals of fire, which hath the most vehement, that's a furious, intense flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly, or it would utterly be contemned. So what we learn here about love is that it is tenacious. We're to love Christ strongly. 
with the tenacity that love breeds. And that tenacious love breeds an endurance that is necessary for the Christian life. Endurance, just hanging in there and staying with it. Even when everything in you is screaming, give up. You just, because you know it's right and because you love it and you want to do what is right, you just stay with it, stay with it. That's endurance. And that's necessary to the Christian life. And the thing that breeds that endurance is love. Uh, Because what do we read about love called charity in 1 Corinthians 13, which is Christian love. Dictionary definition of charity is Christian love. The one thing we read about it in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, it says charity beareth all things. It's amazing how much you'll put up with when you love Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things. And here's what I'm after. Endureth all things. Charity breeds endurance. And like I say, will it never amount to being a Christian like we ought? In fact, we won't even be a Christian if we don't endure. Remember those that receive the word with joy and endure but for a while because they have no root in themselves. They aren't really Christians. Their commitment doesn't go that deep. To enable them to be able to withstand the afflictions and temptations that are certain to come with the Christian profession. They don't endure. And therefore they are not Christians. 2 Timothy 2, 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness. Hardness, that's the things that are difficult. That's why we call them hard. The things that are difficult to understand as well as difficult to go through. Hardness, you've got to endure that to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I know this is particularly talking to ministers, but there's a secondary application to all believers and that we all are engaged in the Christian's fight of faith. And to do that, we must endure hardness. And then uh, if you're a person that is going through a lot of hard times and you're still holding your faith and you're still hanging on to what you believe and you're staying with the church and you're staying with Jesus and you're not giving up on that even though you're having a tough time with it, I want to tell you something this morning. You're blessed. And I'll give you the verse that says it. This was always a favorite thing of Mike to tell people when they were having tough times. You're blessed. And he was right. And here's his verse. Blessed, James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. We usually think of the blessing being escaping it. No, the blessing is in enduring it. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. And it'll pay off in the end. For when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And then lastly, Matthew 24.13, a passage... God willing, we'll have reason to come back to and I think particularly applicable in our times. When Jesus says in Matthew 24, 12 and 13, and because iniquity shall abound, and if it's not abounding now, God help us when it does, the love of many shall wax cold. Like I say, I'll have occasion to come back to that. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So we want to have this tenacity that's going to take us through all of the discouragements we inevitably will face and just hang on to it to the end. It's like I told you last Sunday. I'm in this thing for the long haul. Are you with me? He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. The evidence of our salvation lies in the endurance, not in giving up. And so, but what breeds that endurance? I come back to it. It's love. It's love. It's very tenacious, as it was described there in the Song of Solomon. In fact, uh, with regard to this subject of endurance, I wrote a series of blogs a number of years ago in the From the Pastor's Study, which, by the way, I am in the process of editing all of those to have them put into a book like I did Psalm 119. Um, it's taking me a while. It will take me a while to get through all of that. Jim Wood says, good. <laughs> Because he's the one that will pull it together. But I I wrote this about um, love and how it figures into endurance. How it's the incentive to endure. And I wrote at that time, indifferent, apathetic people who lack heart and zeal are not prone to endure. It's true. Love is the very incentive to endure. Paul wrote that charity, love, endureth all things, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Therefore, when love waxes cold, the motive to endure is gone. 
It is amazing how much people will endure for someone and something they love. How much you'll put up with for someone and something that you truly love. Love is a very tenacious thing. Solomon spoke of the strength and toughness of love in the passage I just read in Song of Songs or Song of Solomon 8 and verse 6. Death, the grave, and a vehement flame which love was compared to are all very tenacious. Solomon said that the grave and fire are never satisfied in Proverbs 30, 15, and 16. And indeed he did. Indeed he did. Proverbs 30, 15, and 16. The horse leech hath two daughters crying, Give, give. And there are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things say not it is enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith it is not enough. And so, grave and the fire are insatiable, tenacious. They never say it is enough. They just keep on, keep on, demanding more. That's the enduring quality of them. Death endures until it finally brings down its victim. The grave endures until it swallows its prey. And just as the giant fires recently occurring in California show, we get an idea of something that doesn't give way easily. Love is so tenacious, so persistent, that floods cannot drown it. All that a man might give for love is of no consequence. Considering Solomon's description of the power of love, we can easily understand why Paul says that love endures. This brings to mind the story of Jacob who had to labor seven years to get Rachel for his wife. And we're told that those seven years seemed unto him but a few days. Why? For the love he had to her. Jacob could endure those seven years because he's had so much love for the woman he was laboring for. Love eases the pain of endurance and helps one better cope with the passage of time. The more we love the Lord, the better we'll be able to endure whatever he sends to us to endure. When we truly love someone, then we delight in pleasing that person. And if we know that enduring our tribulations patiently is pleasing to God, and it is then we will have reason to endure them because we love God and want to please Him. People can generally endure anything better if the endurance has meaning and purpose. And enduring temptation to please God with a reward at the end certainly gives meaning and purpose to it. So we're to love Him supremely, above everything else, sincerely with no pretense, strongly, which breeds tenacity and endurance necessary to the Christian life, and we're to love Him intelligently. This, we're not just talking here about feeling. We're talking here about with our mind. I think that's why Jesus broke that out. Love him with the mind. Intelligently. In other words, know whom it is you love. Know why you love him. And know how to love him. And learn more and more about the one you love. So you have more and more reason to love him. Love him with the mind. It isn't just a feeling. It's an intellectual thing. Love him intelligently and then love him entirely. We're the, with our whole being. Watch it now as I break it out. You love him intellectually with your mind. You love him volitionally with your will. Your choices reveal your love. They're motivated by the love you have for him. You love him emotionally with your feeling, with passion, and physically. With all your might, you should love the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice something about love. Jesus says to love with all your heart. He, he mentions that. I, th- I believe that was the one that uh, was mentioned first. Love him with all of your heart. Let me go back and grab that quickly, please. Uh, with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Mention that first. And so this word heart, we're, t- we're told to love him with the heart. We're told to love him with the mind. We're told to love him with the soul. But the comprehensive word that takes in all three of those is that word heart. And I want you to listen to the definition of heart because where I'm going with this is going to segue into our next verse. But let's define the heart. The heart as the seat of feeling, understanding, and thought. That's just saying we feel with our hearts, we think with our hearts, we understand with our hearts. As the seat of feeling, understanding, and thought equals the mind. So very often what we call the mind is what the Bible also calls the heart. 
And in the widest sense, the word heart includes the functions of feeling, the functions of volition. You know what the word volition means? It comes from the Latin word uh, that means to will, to will. That's your, 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 your volition is your will, that thing that you want to do, that you are inclined to do. And then also with the intellect. So with the heart we feel, with the heart we decide, we will, and with the heart we think and we understand. It includes the functions of feeling, volition, and intellect. The seat, and in it, I'm, I'm elaborating more on the definition here. It is the seat of one's inmost thoughts and secret feelings. That heart is that part of you that no one but God can see into, and no one knows what's there if you don't tell them. It's that part that's strictly between you and God that only, and only God really fully understands it. Do you ever have thoughts and feelings you don't understand why you have them? Of course you do, but God knows. So that's that inward part of you. It's called the soul, the spirit. It's the seat of the inmost thoughts and secret feelings. One's inmost being, the depths of the soul, the soul and the spirit, are both comprehended in that word heart. It's a, it's a, it's a rather encomp- it, it's a pretty well all encompassing word to describe what we would call, or what the Bible calls, the inward man, our innermost self, our immaterial self, as opposed to our physical body. Now, notice that Jesus says we're to love God with all of our heart. Now, once you understand the definition of the word heart, you understand what he's telling you when he says love him with all the heart. He's telling you to love him with all of your heart, which embraces your emotions as well as your will and your intellect. Now, this is important. We're to love him with our emotions, which proceed out of our heart, our will, our decisions, and our intellect our understanding, the things we learn, the things we know. And the fact that the heart is the core of our being. We very often, when we refer to the heart of a thing, we're talking about the core of it, around which everything else centers. What's the heart of the matter? What was the heart of the discourse? What was the main thing that everything else centered around? And I guess you could say today, the core of this discourse is the core, the heart. And loving God with all the heart. And when you understand that, then you can understand why, Paul, why Solomon makes this interesting statement. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 23. Keep thy heart. You want to be careful to guard your heart. Watch your heart. See what goes on inside of here. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Don't let your heart keep you. You keep your heart Keep it with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of life. Everything that goes on in your life, all the issues of your life are coming out of your heart. Your life is shaped, think of it, by the things you know, by the things you decide, by the things you love, by the things you want, by the things you feel. Your whole life is shaped by those things, isn't it? It's a fact. So that's exactly what Solomon is telling us. Out of that come the issues of life. So that's why we want to pay pay careful attention to what's going on in here. What's going on in here. Sometimes I think people pay too much attention on what's going on out there. And not enough attention on what's going on in here. Because this determines the issues of life. And not everything that's going on out there. If there's anything that life has taught me is you can pretty well be happy and content anywhere if you've got things right in here, settled in here. People that hang all their happiness on what happens on them out there are going to be miserable people. This got to be things got to be settled in here and decided in here. When my father was transferred from Jacksonville, Florida to Birmingham, Alabama in the senior year of high school, my senior year of high school, I only went to the school that I'd gone to up to that point for a couple of weeks and then I was transferred. Now one thing I had going in my favor is, favor is I wasn't popular. I wasn't bonded with my peers to where this would be just the most horrible thing that could happen that I would have to leave my classmates in the senior year of high school. So I was, I was blessed that way. 
And I made up my mind I'd never been to Birmingham, Alabama a day in my life. I'd never seen it, never saw it till we drove into it to live there. But as a 17-year-old boy, I made up my mind that before I ever got there, I would like it. And I said, I remember saying this, I don't care if it's an ash heap. I am going to like it. And I did from the first day I set foot there. I never wanted to go back to Jacksonville. You see, it was, in, it was settled here. And when things are settled here, it's amazing how much out there. I mean, it's amazing how much what they do in the high places and in the government won't disturb you and keep you all in a state of you know, imbalance and worry and fear. When this is settled in your relationship with God. So you want to keep your heart for out of it are the issues of life. And so, to love Jesus Christ, the Lord our God, with all of our heart, should be the governing principle. The love of Jesus should be the governing principle. If we're loving Him with all of our heart, then all of the issues of our life are going to flow out of this single thing, the love of the Lord our God, Jesus Christ. It should be the governing principle of what we think, what we decide, and how we feel. So I just simply ask you this question. What role does the love of Jesus Christ play in your thoughts, not only for yourself, but for your family, your decisions, not only for yourself, but for your family and the people over whom you have influence, or the church, and your feelings? What role does the love of Jesus play in your thoughts, in your decisions, and in your feelings? You'll wake up. If the Lord tarries and you live tomorrow morning, how much is the course of that day going to be regulated by the fact that above everyone and everything else, I love Jesus. And I want to make sure that whatever else happens, I do what Jesus wants me to do today. It make a big difference if you get that settled. Now, going back to John 15, the Son of God told us, In John chapter 15, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. So, that's how we can know we're continuing in the love of Christ, is if we're doing what he said, if you're keeping his commandments. And again, that word translated abide there is that word mino, which was rendered continue in the previous verse. So, if I'm keeping the commandments of Christ, this proves two things. Because remember what I taught you last Sunday. That continuing in the love of Jesus has two principal thoughts contained in it. We continue in His love when we continue holding fast to the fact that He loves us. When we stay with that thought, we don't let that realization slip that He loves us. We continue in it that way, holding that fast. And secondly, by loving Him. So continuing the love of Jesus is continuing in His love for me, and continuing in my love for Him, which is expressed by keeping His commandments. Now, if I'm keeping His commandments, He just told me I am continuing in His love, which proves I have, number one, not forgotten that He loves me, and number two, I'm showing I love Him. So you show me somebody that's not keeping the commandments of Christ, and they're forgetting that He loves them. Now, the interesting thing is Jesus gives himself an ex- as an example. If you go back to John 15 and verse 11, he makes the point and gives himself as the example. When he says in verse 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. How do we know Jesus Christ loved his Father? Because he did what his father sent him to do. He kept his commandments. That's how he did it. And so he set an example for us. And this keeping the commandments of the father not only defined every day of his life so that he said his very meat, the very thing that sustained him like food sustains us, was to do the will of God. That that was what drove him. That's what sustained him. That gave him purpose and direction. But that went all the way to the cross. Jesus said before he, he said in John 14, 31, he, was, he was, had started the upper room discourse. And this is what leads me to believe that this discourse, while it began in the upper room, actually continued as they were making their way to Gethsemane. 
because he says there in verse 31 of chapter 14, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. So that leads me to believe that at some point here they're, they're, they're making their way out from the upper room. But what is he doing this for? That the world may know that he loves the Father and is showing that by doing what the Father gave him in commandment. And what was that? Uh, two, ver- two passages. I want you to come over to John chapter 10 and verse 17 and 18, which is going to lead me into what for me personally is a very profound thought that I think we maybe miss. And I'd like to really drive it home. Because I think it's so profound. It just tells me so much about Jesus Christ and makes me want to love him more. But in John 17, 17 and 8, pardon me, John 10, I'm sorry, 17 and 18, Therefore doth my Father love me. Why? Because I lay down my life. God loves Jesus because he died on that cross. Why do you love Jesus? Huh? Don't you love him because he died on that cross? Well, you and the Father have something in common. That ought to make you happy to think about that, that I and God have something in common. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. But watch it. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jesus died on that cross, because that's what God sent him to do. That's what God commanded him to do. It was an obedience to his father, and that's exactly what Philippians chapter 2 tells us regarding the death of Christ on the cross. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Notice that obedience went all this, this way. Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So when he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, and he bowed that head and gave up the ghost, he was obeying the commandment God had given him. I want you to go to that cross, and I want you to die there for the people I give you. He did that because the Father commanded it. He did that in obedience to his Father's commandment, and therefore demonstrated that he was abiding in the love of the Father. Even as my father, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. And this is the thought that I think is so profound. Therefore, Jesus' death on the cross was not only the manifestation of his love for us, which it was to be sure. But it was not only the manifestation of his love for us, but also the manifestation of his love for God, his father. He died on that cross because he loves God. In fact, if any man ever kept the commandment to love God supremely, it was the man Christ Jesus. He fulfilled the law. And the first and great commandment of the law is to love God with all the heart, with all the mind, with all the strength. And I don't care how much he loves us. If the Father had not commanded him to die on that cross, he wouldn't have done it. He died there because he loves God first. Thank God for the love of Jesus, for God his Father, who so loved us that he sent his Son to die for us. And he did that in obedience to his Father. So you think about that and chew on that for a little while. That's a profound thought. And so when we look at this, continue ye in my, continue ye in my love, And we do that by keeping His commandments. There's one thing, children, you want to make sure of more than anything else in your life. And that is that you are continuing and abiding in the love of Jesus Christ. Whatever else you want to make sure of, you be sure of that one thing supremely. Because that's the first and great thing that God requires of us all. In Revelation 1... Pardon me, not Revelation. You know why I said that? Because I'm turning to the book of Jude, which is just before the book of Revelation. And on the left-hand side of the page, it says Revelation at the top instead of Jude. And that's why I did that. So uh, uh, there's a method to the madness. No, it's Jude. It's Jude. And I want you to look at verse 20 and 21. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. 
You got this holy faith in place. Now just build yourself up on that. Just keep growing. Like the young brother said this morning, I want to join the church so I can grow in the Christian faith. That's a good reason, son. And you want to just keep doing that. Building yourself up on that holy faith that you confess today. Praying in the Holy Ghost. And then this commandment. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Just keep with the fact that God loves you and you keep loving Him and make sure you don't slip out of that. Stay in those, stay in those tracks or on those tracks. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if you do that, I want to take you over to Psalm 31, 23. You can have this assurance. If you keep yourself in the love of God, make sure whatever else you do, you love God. Stay with it. It'll breed endurance, tenacity. It'll toughen you for whatever God lays on you that you got to go through. It'll toughen you for that. What do you think took martyrs through prisons and all kinds of beatings and sufferings all the way to painful deaths, even being burned on stakes alive? What, 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 what gave them that kind of, of toughness and willingness to go to this length? It was love because they loved God, because they loved Jesus more than their own life. That they'd sooner forfeit their life than deny the one they loved. It's amazing what people will go through for one they love. I have pointed out before that the gospel of Jesus Christ is written in all creation. It's all over the place if you have eyes to see, which only confirms the veracity of it. I've, I've shown you before how the gospel story gets played out in nature in the four seasons of the year. And you can see, you know, death and uh, things dying in the fall and then death takes over in the winter. And then you have uh, things springing back to life in the springtime and coming to full growth in the summer. And then at the end, the harvest. Isn't that what the gospel is all about? We're dead in trespasses and sins. Jesus Christ comes in the world, takes our place in death and rises from the dead, brings us forth from the dead, brings us to full development. And then the great harvest at the end of the world. And then the cycle repeats. But it's amazing to me how much you can see gospel themes in literature and in productions and plays and movies. And I've, I've said this before. How many stories, how many stories, how many movies, how many plots, how many poems have been written with this theme? The damsel in distress and the hero that risks danger and death to save the damsel in distress. That's the gospel. The church was the damsel in distress. And we brought the distress upon ourselves by our own errant ways. But because our man loved us so much, he risked danger and death to rescue us from the peril. Isn't that the gospel? It's all over the place, people. People don't even realize when they read secular literature, they're reading the very story of the gospel. It, 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 it's all over the place if we have but eyes to see it. Which only confirms to me the truth of it. That it's written all creation. Absolutely. Oh, I could go on and on and on with that one. It's written right in your own human body. Right within your own human body. Your body is constantly dying and coming alive. Do you know that? That's what, that's what waste is. It's your body sloughing off dead cells that were picked up by blood. Your blood picked up those dead cells and transported them to where they could be. Um, evacuated from the body. And yet those same red blood cells, those same blood cells that clean the body of all of its filth are also what bring nourishment and, and, and bring the minerals and the vitamins and the things you extrapolate from your food in order to build new cells, clearing out dead ones and building new ones. So there's this constant death Resurrection, death, life going on inside of you and all of it, all of it being enabled by the blood. Does that sound like anything that we all love about the blood of Jesus and how it washes out all the filth and brings new life? There's the gospel flowing in our veins. And on and on I could go with that. And I've done it before and I, I don't want to get too sidetracked here. I don't even know how, how well, anyway... You just make sure of this. You stay with loving God. <laughs> that was, how did I get to there? But anyway, stay with the love of God. Whatever you do, and you've got this over here in Psalm 31, 23. This is precious children. Oh, now notice there's passion in that word. Oh, that's an expression of emotion. This is the, the psalmist is really driving home the point. Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints. 
for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. The bottom line being this, you stay with the love of God, you keep loving the Lord, you keep continuing the love of Jesus, and God is going to take care of you. He preserveth the faithful. He's going to take care of you. And you just can take that one to the bank. Now, that's the end of that verse, and we're ready now to go into the next one. But uh, the thoughts that I've made, uh, uh, brought forward to you about the heart being the seat of feeling and understanding and thought, the functions of emotion coming out of the heart, as well as decision, volition, and intellect. This is going to segue nicely into this verse. And I'm, I'm going to announce to you now, we're at verse 11, and we're going to come to a screeching halt. As if we haven't done that already. I don't know how many sermons I've preached, and I'm only now to verse 11. But there is so much in this verse, and you know me. I'm going to ring that baby to I get everything out of it I can because there's so much in it and it, it addresses an extremely important aspect of our Christian life. John chapter 15 verse 11 These things have I spoken unto you so you can take the whole discourse from verse 1 up to now and he's telling you why he's giving this discourse. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. What is that? And we'll investigate that, God willing. My joy. What is the joy of Jesus? Well, we, 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 we'll get there. That my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. First thing I want to point out is the only way for us to really have full and complete joy is to have the joy of Jesus. Our joy will never be complete unless we have His joy. So the challenge for us in this verse is going to be to explore what is the joy of Jesus. I don't even know if we'll get there today. Because I just want to look at this joy and and focus on one aspect of it. First of all, true to form, we define our term. And and right right up front, right right at the doorway, we're going to see something very important. Joy is defined as a vivid emotion of pleasure. We all know what it is to feel pleasure. It's pleasure is something we feel. It's a vivid emotion of pleasure. That's what joy is. It's an emotion. Arising from a sense of well-being or satisfaction. The feeling, see, notice that definition, or state of being highly pleased or delighted. It is exultation. That's E-X-U-L-T. And the word exult means to leap for joy. I mean, that's that thing that just makes you so happy. You just feel like you're springing with exuberance. Exultation of spirit, gladness, and delight. And this subject is so important because if you're a Bible reader and you've paid attention, you know that joy plays a huge role in the Christian experience. In fact, if you don't have any joy as a Christian, you're weak. Because the Bible says the joy of your Lord is your strength. In Nehemiah chapter 8. So this, we come here to a a very important point. But since joy, listen now, is defined as an emotion, it logically follows that emotions or feelings play a key role in our holy religion. Now I know that I've had a lot of negative things to say about emotions in the past for good reason. Because a lot of people, they follow their emotions and their feelings... And that takes people where they shouldn't go. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how to handle this thing of emotion and feeling in a biblical framework so that your emotions don't carry you where you don't need to go. That's the problem nowadays. So much of religion with people is simply purely a matter of emotion. They go to the church that makes them happy, makes them feel good. It's all about feeling. Well, I, I, I don't like that preacher. He doesn't make me feel good. I, he doesn't give me a happy feeling. And that's one of the characteristics of the last days. Because he says in 2 Timothy 3 that they will be lovers of pleasure. That's feeling more than of God. They love what they feel more than they love God. And that's a danger. The Bible talks about those who receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved when it says they have pleasure. That's feelings and unrighteousness. They don't care whether it's right or wrong as long as it makes them feel good. They think that's 
The important thing, how many times have you heard somebody say, as long as you're happy, that's all that matters? And what they mean by that is, as long as you feel good, that's all that matters. Oh, no, that is not all that matters. And so I've had a lot of, uh, in fact, if you're not careful, emotions can actually work against faith rather than being the handmaiden of faith. But you'll get that point as we move forward. But I just want to say this, that having said all the negative things I have over the years about emotion and the dangers of being led by emotion, do not mistake me for saying that emotions don't play a key role in Christian experience because they do. Joy is defined as an emotion. And so it is a very important part of our Christian experience. Remember, we have already seen that we were commanded to love God with all our heart. And this is where I'm going right now. I'm just going to deal with the role of emotions in our religion. We've already defined joy. We're going to look at love and see the emotional dimension of love. We're going to look at zeal, see the emotional dimension. And we're going to see what it means to have love wax cold. And that all ties into this issue of emotion. So I'm just showing you how important emotion is in Christian religion. But anyway, we've already considered the command to love God with all of our heart. And we saw that by definition, the heart is the seed of feeling or emotions as well as volition. That's your decision making capacity and intellect. That's your understanding and knowledge with your mind and heart. Now, let me just show you the heart as a seat of feeling. I'm going to give you a string of verses. I've done this before. I'm going to do it again to show you the, how the heart is described as feeling, feeling. Come to Leviticus 19:17. Leviticus 19:17. Have you ever hated anybody? That's a stupid question. Of course you have. I mean, really hated somebody. Do you feel that? <laughs> Do you feel that when you really hate somebody? Of course you do. There's certainly a dimension of feeling and hate. And the more intense the hate, the more intense you feel it. Leviticus 19, 17, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. See? But notice where that hate's taking place. In the heart. In the heart, the realm of emotion. He says, Take heed that thou hate not thy brother in thine heart, but thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. So there's the emotion of hate found right there in the heart. And then look at Proverbs 15, 13. Proverbs 15, 13. A merry heart. Now there's, there's, a, there's a heart that's feeling good. Feeling upbeat. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. When the heart is merry, you can see it in the face. And when it isn't, you can see it in the face. Our countenance has revealed so much about us. I can tell sometimes when people walk in the door of this church, I can tell, oh, oh, they got a problem. I can see it. It's written all over. And you can see it in me. You can see it in me. I don't always hide it well. I don't even really try. <laughs> you know, hey, listen, I'm having a rough time. Join in. The Bible says weep with those that weep. Yeah, remember them that are in affliction as being yourselves in the body. I'll be sure to keep you reminded. Okay, Proverbs fifteen thirteen: A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by the sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. See, the sorrow, that's an emotion. I mean, how else can you define it but that? In Isaiah 65, 14, here again, emotion coming out of the heart. But my servants shall sing for joy, watch it, of heart. There it is. But ye shall cry for sorrow of heart. There's two emotions, both of them coming out of the heart. And shall howl for vexation of spirit. And then over in um, John 16, we'll give the authority of the Son of God. And then I think I will have made the point. In John 16, 6, in this same discourse, our Savior said, But because I've said these things, sorrow hath filled your heart. There's an emotion filling the heart. Or verse 22. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. So I think that makes the case, and I could multiply that by more to simply show the heart as the seat of feeling. So it comes down to this, brethren, as we've been talking about continuing in the love of Jesus. If we experience no feeling in our love to God, 
then it follows we are not loving God with all our heart in as much as the heart incorporates the feelings as well as the decisions, the will, and the intellect, the understanding. We don't love God with all of our heart if we don't love Him with all of our understanding, knowledge, will, decision, and feeling. In fact, if you look at a dictionary definition of the word love, it incorporates the word feeling in the definition. It means that disposition or state of feeling with regard to a person which manifests itself in solicitude for the welfare of the object. In other words, you you want things to go well for the person you love. And usually also in delight, that's emotion, that's pleasure, in his presence and desire, that's emotion, longing, desire for his approval, warm affection, attachment. There's no way to get around it. Emotions play a very significant role in our holy religion. The Apostle Paul writes about uh, the Philippians and and the great love that he had for them. And he talked about them and he said in uh, Philippians chapter 1, I I just happened to think of this in passing. He said in verse 8 of chapter 1, For God is my record how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And that word bowels refers to your innermost feelings and longings. Jesus has those. And so do we if we have the bowels of Jesus Christ in us. Uh, What do we read about Joseph? When he was so longing to connect with his brethren, his bowels moved toward them. When he realized who they were, but they didn't know who he was yet. And he was so anxious for that connection that his bowels yearned after them. We all know what that feels like. We all know what that feels like. I mean, I I just had an experience with that with my friends in Germany that we love very dearly. You know, we we got there and knocked on the door, walked up to the door of where they live and knocked on the door and Helga opens the door. Ah! What is that? That's her bowels moving, longing to embrace us. And I remember when I said goodbye to them, it was the reverse. Now the sorrow filled our heart. Our bowels were yearning after our friends from whom we must part. And I hugged Helga to myself and I said, Ich liebe dich so sehr. I love you so much. And it hurt to say goodbye. So that, that illustrates it, you see. And then how about this to just show you the role that emotions play in our holy religion. Our religion is supposed to be characterized by zeal. Let me give you the verses that say it. And then when you look at the definition, you will see that the very essence of zeal is feeling, emotion. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, Titus 2, 14, it says, Jesus Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So Jesus Christ died to have an impact on what we feel. On the whole of our person, not only on what we think, not only on what we understand and decide, but what we feel is also a product of the death of Christ on that cross. In fact, there was a church over here that was lacking in feeling in their love for Jesus Christ. And he, uh, that's the church at Laodicea. We'll visit that again momentarily. But in Revelation 3.19, he said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous, therefore. Stir it up. Stir it up. Be zealous, therefore. And repent. A command for us to be zealous, a command for us to address our emotions in this matter and to take what measures we can to stir them in the direction of love toward our God. And we've already told you one way to do that is just to remember how much he's loved you. When I, when I brought that sermon to you here, when I started this series, and I told you that in this upper room discourse was the first time that the Lord actually utilized the second personal pronoun in addressing people and saying directly to them, I have loved you. Did you feel something from that? Did that stir something in you? I have loved you. And he said that to the church at the first communion service. So that tells me when I'm in a church of Jesus Christ after the order of the holy apostles keeping the Lord's Supper, I'm right as I would say in the firing line of those words, I have loved you. And you may remember when I taught you that, I was expressing a great deal of passion, feeling. And I wasn't faking that. And I'm not faking it now. 
Zeal. In biblical language, it denotes ardent. That means burning feeling or fervor. Taking the form of love. You can be zealous in your love or wrath. You can be zealous in your wrath or jealousy or righteous indignation. In a specialized sense, it's ardent. That is burning love or affection. Fervent. That again carries the idea of like a fervent fire. Fervent devotion or attachment. You're not just devoted, but you're fervently so. Ardent. Again, burning. Earnest. I mean, you're really serious about this. You're really into this thing. An eager desire. Do you, when you came to church this morning, did you eagerly desire to be, I mean, you really were excited to come here? Really excited about it? Or was it just, oh, well, this is what we do on Sunday morning? Eager desire. Intense ardor in the pursuit of some end. That's in passionate eagerness in favor of a person or cause. Enthusiasm as displayed in action. So, I mean, how can you exclude emotion from Christian experience when you're commanded to be zealous and you've got a definition of zeal like that? In fact, the opposite, while you're in, I think I took you to Revelation 3.19. You want to stay there because I'm going to show you the opposite of zeal. And show you what it is when it's missing. In Revelation chapter 3.14. Revelation 3.14 And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, that's Jesus Christ, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Get with it or get out. That's basically what he's saying. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Lukewarmness is something he cannot digest. It nauseates him. But listen to what lukewarm means. When referring to persons, it means having little warmth or depth of feeling. Lacking zeal. Indifferent. When it came to their Christianity and their relationship to Jesus Christ, they're just kind of, were just kind of, just limping along. Uh, not any real big deal. If I'm there, fine. If I'm not there, fine. You know, no big deal. No big deal. Let me tell you something. Christianity is a big deal. And if it's not a big deal, it isn't worth your time and your sacrifice and effort. If it is what God says it is, it's worth everything we've got. And if it isn't, then forget it. Go do something else. Don't waste God's time and our time lollygagging around. And so he says, and you say, well, you're being very harsh there. No harsher than he is. He says, because thou sayest I'm rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. Oh, that I forgot a point. No, it's such an important point. I'll come back to that in a minute. It's real important. Because thou sayest, don't let me forget it. Okay, you'll be reminding me, Brendan. Mike used to do that for me, so you take his place now today and remind me. Because it's so good. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You know who the most miserable Christian is? It's the one that thinks he's okay. Amen. Well, I love Jesus. I'm, I'm a good Christian. That's the one, anybody that comes up and boasts to you what a good Christian they are, that's the one you want to watch out for. My grandmother would say it's a snake in the grass. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness that thou do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see, as the many as I love I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent, repent. I mean, when you look at that definition of lukewarm, it's the absence of that depth of feeling that's supposed to characterize our holy religion. And let me insert this point. I want to go back to love. I think I pointed out to you both by the dictionary definition and uh, by the definition of the word heart and what's involved in the heart that we can show both biblically and from a dictionary that love has the dimension of feeling. 
When will you love with the heart that incorporates the feeling as well as the will and as well as the intellect? And then I pointed out to you five ways that we're supposed to love Jesus. If we, if we love him as we ought, with all the heart, mind, soul, and strength, remember those five things. We love him supremely. We love him sincerely. We love him strongly. We love him intellectually. And we love him entirely. Now, when I got through elaborating on that, I can well imagine that some of you out there felt the pang of conviction that I don't love him as much as I should. Anybody feel that this morning as I talked about that? Did you see yourself somehow falling short of loving him that way? Join the club. And let me tell you, the fact that you feel that way is only evidence that you do love him. Because the more you love him, the more you will realize how poor your love is. Curious, but it's true. It's just like it is with knowledge. The more I know, the more I realize I don't know. The more I learn, the more ignorant I realize I am. And the better you try to live, and the closer you try to live to Jesus, the more the light of that presence is going to shine on your sin to make it look more horrible than otherwise it would look, so that out of that great love and effort to live righteously, you're going to see yourself as the chief of sinners. Does that make sense? It was put like this by... um, um, C.S. Lewis, I thought this was so good. And so what I'm trying to say to you this morning, I realize when I preach on how we're supposed to love the Lord, and you're sitting there thinking, oh my, oh, I need to love Him more, I need to love Him more. Good, good. Stay with that thought. I mean, somebody that says, oh, I just don't know how I could love Him more than I do. Again, watch out. Watch out. When a man, Mr. Lewis said this, when a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. That's true. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. A moderately bad man knows he's not very good. A thoroughly bad man thinks he's all right. I mean, go in prisons. (laughs) And visit the most hardened criminals. And you'll find out what nice people they really are. It's true. The better you are, the worse you see yourself being. And the worse you are, the better you see yourself being. And he reasoned it out like this. He said, this is common sense, really. You understand sleep when you're awake, not while you're sleeping. (laughs) Duh. (laughs) You can see mistakes in arithmetic when your mind is working properly. While you're making the mistakes, you cannot see them. That's why you make them. So the more you understand about the math, the more you're able to understand your mistakes. The more you understand righteousness, the more you understand your own righteousness, your unrighteousness. And you see it in all of its lurid hues under the light of the presence of God in your life. He said, you cannot understand the nature of drunkenness. You can, pardon me, let me rephrase that. You can understand the nature of drunkenness when you're sober, not when you're drunk. Good people know about both good and evil. Bad people do not know about either. I thought that was really good. Another way to illustrate it is when I was uh, on the train going to Suzhou from Shanghai in China, Um, I had to stand most of the way. It was crowded after I had flown all night and spent a restless night on a bench in an airport in Shanghai waiting to catch the train the next morning. But anyway, I engaged, I met a Frenchman and we engaged in conversation in French and he told me something that was very comforting because I always feel, I I feel my deficiencies and, and I'm a perfectionist and so I keenly am aware of the fact that I'm not speaking it like a native even though they tell me I do well. But he told me, he said, the way I know that you speak French and know French well is the fact that when you're speaking it, you catch your mistakes and you correct them. And I do that all the time. I do that when I'm speaking German. I do that when I'm speaking English. (laughs) And um, he said, the fact that you're able, when you're speaking it, to recognize that you just made a mistake and correct it 
is a sign you really know it quite well. And I think that that illustrates what I'm talking about. The more you love God, the more you're sensible of the fact that you don't love him as much as you should. I want to read a hymn. We've sung it before, but it's been a long while. And I think that the reading it will, will really drive it home to you well, this point that I'm on that I think is so important. Uh, listen to this. This was written by John Newton. We're all familiar with the history of John Newton. Isn't he the one that wrote Amazing Grace? All right. This was written by the author of Amazing Grace. Tis a point I long to know. Oft it causes anxious thought. Do I love the Lord or no? Am I his or am I not? Doesn't that cause you some anxious thought? Do I really love him? Am I really his? If I love, why am I thus? Why this dull and lifeless frame? You see, the more zealous you are for the Lord, the more you'll realize how lacking you are. See the point I'm getting at, children? See where we're going with this? I'm trying to encourage you. Uh, The first part probably had you ready to crawl under the table. Now now we're going to lift you back up. So if I love, why am I thus? Why this dull and lifeless frame? Hardly sure can they be worse who have never heard his name. Could my heart so hard remain? Prayer a task and burden prove? Does prayer ever prove a burdensome task for you? It sure does for me. He said, every trifle give me pain if I knew a Savior's love. When I turn my eyes within, all is vain and dark and wild, filled with unbelief and sin. Can I deem myself a child? If I pray or hear or read, sin is mixed with all I do. What are the odds that as I've been up here preaching this sermon this morning, some of you out there have had a sinful thought? I'd say the odds are pretty high. We all do. So did he. He said, when I, if I pray or hear or read, sin is mixed with all I do. You that love the Lord indeed, tell me, is it thus with you? Is it thus with you? Is it thus with you? And I'm talking to people that love the Lord, really. These are the people that really love the Lord, that feel this. He said, could I joy his saints to meet? Choose the way I once abhorred. Find at times the promise sweet if I did not love the Lord. Let me love thee more and more. Touch me with thy love, I pray. If I have not loved before, help me to begin today. I don't know what to say to that, but a hearty amen. And that is, I could have written that. Any of you could have written that? Of course you could. If you love the Lord, indeed you could, because I just read your experience. The more you love Him, the more you realize how little you do. And so, anyway, I'm just going to close out with this point. Uh, I told you I'd come back here, and this will be it for today. Matthew 24 and verse 12. I've been up here longer than I realized. Matthew 24, 12. Doesn't, if anybody's complaining, they don't act like it. You can tell me later. Pastor, that was too long. You gave me too much information. Would you shorten it up next Sunday? And I'll take that under advisement. Okay, Matthew 24. I'm not saying I'll do it, but I'll take it under advisement. Matthew 24, 12 and 13. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. That word cold means, watch it now. Notice the element of of emotion. Uh, Cold means void of ardor, warmth, or intensity of feeling. It's that, yeah, lukewarm, yeah, void of intensity of feeling, lacking enthusiasm, hardiness, or zeal, indifferent, apathetic, when referring to persons, their affections, and actions. This definition clearly shows that love has an element of feeling in it. And over against those whose love waxes cold are those who endure unto the end, whose love remains strong and vibrant, breeding the endurance, as we noted above, love does. And so, brethren, be zealous and uh, get with the program. And Lord willing, we'll investigate this further next Sunday. May God add His blessing and forgive anything that was uttered amiss. Amen.